Hello, it's Scott Manley here. Today I want to answer the question often asked by kids at live shows. What is the most powerful rocket engine ever flown? And uh, well, the common answer to that that is given, say, by Google is the F1. The F1 was the first stage engine on the Saturn V, the biggest rocket ever flown. It needed five of those to lift its 3,000 tons off the ground and into the air. It generated seven meganewtons of thrust using kerosene and liquid oxygen as a fuel. There are stories of the testing where to get the engine running without braking due to combustion instability, they ran hundreds, even thousands of tests on the injector plate. And some of these were very destructive. For all that, it isn't the most powerful rocket engine ever flown. That honor falls to the RD-170, a Soviet engine that was designed for the Energia rocket. Now, it was able to generate eight meganewtons of thrust. And in fact, uh, in every objective way, it is superior to the F1. It had a higher specific impulse. It generated, a, it was like something like 337 seconds, whereas the F1 gets 304, so that's like 10% better. Uh, it obviously had much better plumbing to get that. It was using a staged combustion cycle as opposed to the far more low-tech uh, gas generator cycle that we get on the F1. But the main reason why many people don't include it as the most powerful rocket engine is because they see that it has four combustion chambers. The Soviets were never able to uh, solve the combustion problems that the US managed to solve. Perhaps they just weren't willing to throw hundreds of uh, combustion chambers into the testing meat grinder to figure out how. Instead, they use a single powerhead with one set of pumps and plumbing, and they feed that into four separate smaller combustion chambers. And this enabled them to get superior performance and lift their Energia rocket into space. The Energia, of course, was the rocket that carried the Soviet shuttle, the Buran. It also launched another payload, which is, uh, well, uh, it did a 360 and landed back on the Earth. Uh, <laughs> so it didn't have the greatest service record, but it is undeniably a superior engine to the F-1. However, the same technology has continued to be used because what they did was they basically got rid of two of the combustion chambers. They cut it in half, kept essentially the same powerhead, and that became the RD-180, which powers the Atlas V, which has been you know, a very reliable rocket for the last you know, 20 years, 25 years, 20 years or so. Uh, even then, they actually cut it in half again and created the RD-190 series, which is used in a few rockets as well. So, you know, this has had quite a great legacy and it ended up flying more than the F1 engine. But of course, these liquid rocket engines you know, they can't actually compete with solid rocket motors. So solid rocket motors are vastly more powerful, significantly more powerful, let's say. The boosters attached to the space shuttle, those generate 12 meganewtons of thrust. The, those on the SLS, they're going to be even bigger. They're going to add an extra segment, so they're going to get even more thrust. And yeah, 50% more thrust than the RD-170 might sound impressive, but even then, that isn't the most powerful rocket motor ever tested. That honor falls to something called the AJ-260. And the 260 is a measurement in inches. It measures the diameter of the chamber on this solid rocket motor. So they were going to have a rocket motor that was 21 feet, 8 inches across. Basically, uh, you know, ooh, sorry, 6.6 <laughs> meters. Had to do the math in my head. 6.6 meter wide. It was, you know, huge. They wanted, they couldn't transport this across the country. So they built the production facilities in Florida, really close to the Cape. They were thinking that this would be a very large solid rocket motor that could assist in the uh, Apollo program. The, the diameter is the same diameter as the Saturn I. So the, one option was to, just to simply replace the fr first stage and uh, you know, fly that. But they also thought about having these attached around a larger booster to get even more mass into orbit. So yeah, they built a test facility down in Florida. They were going to uh, ship in the casings and fill them on site and then test them there. 
Interesting thing is that the casings were so much larger than anything that had been previously developed. The uh, aviation, the aerospace engineers were a little concerned about how they would develop this. But then, of course, somebody realized that they'd been building very large cylinders that were able to handle pressures for a while now. They just were called submarines rather than aircraft. Yeah, I mean, they literally used submarine manufacturing techniques to make this work. The testing facility involved a 50 meter deep pit, uh, pit in Florida. And I don't know if you know Florida, the water table's pretty close to the surface. So going down 50 meters underneath it was, you know, not, not a trivial thing in, a, in and of itself. The test engines were half length from the final proposed design. They would uh, be inserted into the pit upside down and then filled with the fuel for testing. There would be load sensors at the bottom, and yeah, when these things fired, they lit up the skies for miles and miles around. You know, you could see the, the plume lighting up the sky from uh, Miami and all that, right? <laughs> but um, yeah, they fired them three times. The first time they generated 16 mega newtons. So that's handily superior to the space shuttle boosters. Second time they managed that. The third time they uh, added a nozzle and apparently got it up to something like 24 mega newtons, but it blew out the nozzle. And that test represents the most powerful rocket engine ever fired that I can find. So impressive stuff. It was huge, but yet yeah, never actually flew on any launch vehicle. So, you know, that's uh, perhaps why it might not appear on any lists. But if we go back to liquid fueled engines, there's one other project related to Apollo worth mentioning, and that is the M1. That would have been an upper stage hydrogen fueled engine with the same thrust as the F1 engine. It would generate about seven mega newtons. And this engine bell would have been bigger still than the F1. This would have made it the largest combustion chamber on any rocket. It never got completely built or tested, but many of the components were. So it's an interesting uh, step on the path to the question of what is the largest rocket engine ever fired. So yeah, there's your answers. The F1 is the largest single chamber, or most powerful single chamber engine. The RD-170 is the most powerful rocket engine full stop. And then when you get into solid rocket motors, the space shuttle boosters are the most powerful boosters flown. And the AJ-260 is the most powerful one ever tested. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe. Thank <laughs> you.